Judges chapter number 2 we'll begin reading in verse number 8 the Bible says and Joshua the son of Nun the servant of the Lord died being a hundred and ten years old and they buried him in the border of his inheritance and Timnath Harris and the mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gaash and also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord nor yet the works which he had done for Israel and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods and the, of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger and they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth let's pray Heavenly Father Lord we do thank you for another opportunity to be in your church tonight Lord I thank you for another opportunity to stand up and present your word Lord I pray that you'd head from my mind in that you put a bridle about my tongue and Lord I pray that you'd help your people tonight in Jesus name we pray amen now a little bit of history as our introduction tonight we know that when in the book of Exodus God leads Israel out of the land of Egypt Moses was God's man he was the one that spoke to God listened to what God had to say he was the lawgiver in the eyes of the Israelites and he would go up on a mountain he would go away into a private place and the Spirit of God would come down and meet with Moses in fact in many accounts you'll find that God would stand in the midst of that uh, pillar that was made up of cloud and the Bible says that God spoke face to face with Moses as a friend it was face to face with God Almighty though he couldn't see him he was inside of the cloud but face to face Moses delivered unto God's people what God would have for Israel to do whether it was law whether it was direction whether it was guidance and we find that Moses led the children of Israel through all the years and the decades that they were in the wilderness to the border of the promised land that God promised to give unto them and then as Moses died Joshua was the man that took up the mantle as God's man in fact in verse number uh, 8 you'll find that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord just like Moses before him Joshua was mentored and took to heart that he was not a leader among God's people he was a servant for God's people and throughout the Bible you'll find that those that were most influential in leading others didn't see themselves as a patriarch or a hierarchy or a higher ling they saw themselves as servants to do the will of God for as many people as they possibly could and Joshua God's man dies at 110 years old and you see that they buried him in the land of his inheritance he was buried in the promised land the land that God had promised unto Joshua he lived on the rest of the days of his life once he led the children of Israel into the promised land and you find that he was buried on the side of a hill or on the side of a mountain called Ephraim I'd go study that we don't have time to get into that but it was a place that God had promised just for Joshua and Joshua had the blessing of living just where God wanted him to live and he lived as a great leader because he lived as a servant and he did his best to lead God's people as God directed him then you'll find in verse number 10 that the rest of that generation they went and slept with their fathers they died well who was that generation that was the generation that crossed over Jordan that was the generation where the priests took the Ark of the Covenant and they committed their feet to the river Jordan and as they committed their feet God parted the waters that's the generation that saw Joshua build that memorial out in the middle of the uh, river Jordan that no man could walk on their own but yet there was a monument there to show that God really did do all those things that this generation had told the younger generation about and you go and study it out there were many memorials there were many uh, altars that people would build as a marker or to jog the memory of future generations that God really did do all those things that God's people said they saw him do but after that generation fed off the next generation remembered not God in fact in the verses that we read verse number 11 the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord they served Balaam and other false gods in fact their lifestyle mimicked a lot of the Egyptians that they were in captivity under this generation was never in captivity but yet their lives they had many gods just like the Egyptians had many gods 
And somewhere between the generation of Joshua and the next generation, you know, the Bible tells us that a generation at this time was 40 years. Not that long of time. Right? In fact, you know, I haven't been alive 40 years, but there's a lot of people, <clears throat> our pastor, who thinks that 40 years ago was just yesterday. It's not that big a gap of time. If you've been alive, that you can remember 40 years ago, just like it was yesterday. You can tell what the styles were. You can say what cars were on the road. You can say what music was on the radio. 40 years is just a blink of an eye when it comes to all of eternity. Not that long of a time, but it only took a space of 40 years for the message that God had left, that God was able to keep Israel, to prosper Israel, to be with Israel, and be their God so long as Israel followed after him. And that message had been forgotten. In fact, I dare say that the shape we're in today, 40 years ago, people would have never thought it had gotten this bad. 40 years ago, people would have said, well, that can never happen in America. Or that'll never happen in churches that claim that they believe the Word of God and claim to follow after God. But then yet today, it's reality. In fact, people have become so accustomed to it that people don't even bat an eye at it anymore. It didn't say that Israel did bad in the eyes of the Lord. It said evil. The exact opposite of what God would have had them doing. Right? And so today there are things that go on the exact opposite of what they were doing 40 years ago. And it happens little by little, but before you know it, you turn around and say, how in the world would we get here? That's the shape that Israel was in. And you find, if we go on to, you know, if we were to go on and read verse number 14 and 15, you find that whatever they did, wherever they went, whoever they encountered, God caused judgment to come upon them. Why? Because they did evil in the sight of the Lord. But then the story shifts a little bit. Part of that history lesson What's this book called? Judges. Chapter number 2 is the introduction of how judges came to be in the history of Israel. And you'll find in verse number 16, nevertheless, what's that mean? In spite of how evil Israel was, nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of all their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers and following other gods to serve them and bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. What's that little bit of history say? Well, God in His faithfulness, as Israel was vexed and they were reaping what they had sown in their evil ways, their groanings came up before the Lord and He remembered His promise. He always kept his promise. Israel was the one that defaulted on the promise. But as their groanings would come up, they would repent to the Lord and say, we have done wickedly in the eyes of God. And God had prepared, even while they were still doing evil, God had prepared a judge to step in and to be the mediator between God and the nation of Israel. And then after that judge died, in verse number 9, they returned. The entire book of Judges is a cycle of Israel doing evil, being oppressed, receiving vexation, and the groaning of their heart, saying, Lord, we did wrong. God being faithful and raising up a judge. And that judge leading God's people to where they were following after God. And then the cycle would repeat and repeat and repeat. Don't look down at the Israelites. How many times do we have to go through something to finally realize what God was trying to teach us? But generation after generation, you find it was a pattern. In fact, we can go after the book of Judges. We can look at the kings of Israel. One king would do right in the eyes of God. God was blessed. One king would do evil in the eyes of God. Then after the kingdom was divided between Israel and Judah, 
When Judah was following after God, Israel wouldn't be. And when Israel was following after God, Judah wouldn't be. Over and over, a cycle. But through it all, God used one. It says that he raised up judges, but he only ever had one judge at a time. Just one. And that one person was able to judge. And as a result of judgment, Israel did right in the eyes of God. Well, you say, well, what did that judge do? Well, sometimes that judge was like Samson. He was a judge. Not only did he lead people in what God said was right and what God said was wrong, God was with, you know, verse number 18, and when the Lord raised them up judges, and the Lord was with the judge. So long as the judge was obedient, God used them to do things that no mere man could do, but yet that the power of God and the hand of God could do for the people of Israel. Great and mighty works that proved that the judge was who he said he was. Nothing special about the judge. The thing that was special about them is that they trusted and followed Jehovah. And it only took one generation for them to fall back into their wicked ways. One generation after Joshua. After the judge died, one generation. So as we read this story, we find that in terms of one, it only takes one to cause a whole lot of damage. But what we're going to preach on tonight is what can God do with one? What can God do with one? He only ever had one judge at a time. That one judge was an answer to the prayers of Israel. Lord, send us someone that can show us how you would have us do. What were the responsibilities of the judge? To declare, they already had the law that was being given unto Moses, but the judge was there to remind this is what God said we need to do. This is what God said we don't need to do. And with that one judge, according to verse number uh, 18, that one judge would deliver them out of the hands of their enemies all the days of the judge. Why? Because the Lord had mercy and compassion. That's what the latter part of that verse says. For it repented the Lord because of the groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. God still loved them. They were still His people. And because he had compassion on them, his love for them, his mercy and his grace showed forth that he didn't give them what they deserved. Instead, he raised up a judge. And with one judge, God could turn the whole nation, turn the whole path of how Israel was headed and return them to where they were supposed to be. What was that? God's chosen people. A peculiar people. Called out people. A people that God wanted to bless and bestow mercies upon. And they lived in victory so long as there was a judge. I look around, a lot of people, they say, hey, things are getting bad. That might be true. Worst it can get is we go to heaven. But the worse it gets, maybe it has to get bad for God to really show up and people say, only God could do that. But God doesn't work so that no one takes notice. There always has to be one. One that is obedient. One that is ready to do what God wants them to do. Notice it says that God raised up judges. You know what that means? That is just a normal person until God raised them to a new position. But you know what set all these people apart? We already mentioned Samson. Let's look at Samson. When Samson did as God wanted him to do, God was with him. When Samson's heart got far away from God, that's when God no longer used Samson. In fact, the accounts that we have, Samson, for all of his life, he was a whoremonger, an adulterer. Did that stop God from using No, as long as... He did what God told him to do and was obedient to obey. God can use anybody. We're the ones that limit God on who he can't use. I'll remind you that Moses was a murderer. Joshua was a general. He killed more people than any of us can imagine. He slew all them Philistines and the Perizzites and the Hittites and the Amorites. He was the one that led the troops into Jericho when they spoiled it. What's the Bible say? That they left none alive. 
Joshua was a man of bloody hands. Right, we think, well, the successor to Moses, Moses never lifted a sword. God gave him a staff to lead as a shepherd. While Moses was leading, Joshua was down on the battlefield. But you find that after they got where God wanted them to be, they had peace. But you know what Moses and Joshua and all these judges have in common? I'm sure they had a lot of excuses on why God couldn't use them, but they just got out of the way and let God use them. So as I was reading this, I was thinking, it's just one judge. There's a lot of times God just takes one person. Makes a big difference. First off, let's look at the difference God can make with one voice. What was the judge? A voice of judgment. They looked at what was going on and they said it how it was. They said, that's not right in the eyes of God. As I thought about that, brought back to memory, there was one, a voice crying in the wilderness. His name was John the Baptist. He was born around the same time as Jesus. How do you know that? Because his mom was pregnant at the same time that Mary was pregnant. I don't know the difference, but I do know that one day God called him out in the middle of nowhere. He said, hey, you're the voice. You're the forerunner. You're the one that's going to proclaim that my son is here and he's about ready to start his earthly ministry. John the Baptist didn't take thought of what he was going to eat, what he was going to wear, where he was going to stay. In fact, the world looked at him and said, that guy's nuts. He's wearing camel hair, and he claims that he walks around eating locusts and honey. Not a diet that I would ascribe to by choice. But yet you don't find that he was so weak that he couldn't preach to those that came by his way. You don't find that he was lacking in anything. In fact, you say, well, how did John the Baptist learn everything that he needed to preach? God taught it to him. He's out there in the wilderness. God just preaching John the Baptist, and then John the Baptist turned around and started preaching to other people. What did he say? Repent. Make straight the way of the Lord. Right? His time has come. All those multitudes that showed up when Jesus started his earthly ministry, how do you think they all heard about Jesus? We do know that he sent disciples two by two, 70 of them, into cities to prepare the way. But long before the disciples were on the scene, who was there when Jesus showed up to be baptized? And John the Baptist said, I'm not worthy to baptize you. I need to be baptized. Jesus said, suffer it to be so. Who do you find there that day? A whole bunch of people. The way was prepared for the Lord. God could have used anybody, but he chose John the Baptist. What did John the Baptist say? Okay. All the doubts or all the reasons why it couldn't be so. But yet, what did Jesus call John the Baptist? Greatest man ever born a woman. By the way, that includes the apostles because they were born at that time. What he's saying, one person made a great big difference. God could have used that heavenly host of angels that sang on the night of his birth to go and proclaim, but God chose one. You don't find that there was another one. You don't find, you know, Donald the Baptist out there preaching in the wilderness next to him. It's John the Baptist. Just chose one voice. And with that one voice, many people heard. You say, well, there was a lot that didn't hear. Yeah, but God used one person to make a whole great difference. Think about one person, what God can do with one. Right, we know the story of the loaves of fish. Just one boy giving his lunch. A whole bunch of people were fed. But in the same vein, one person that just gives what they have. Right? David comes to mind. David was a shepherd. David wasn't a man of war. David never been on the battlefield. Been on the backside of hills, raising his dad's sheep. But yet, when he sees an uncircumcised Philistine, just one person didn't proclaim, he didn't start preaching to him. He rebuked Israel. Who is this uncircumcised? Is there not a cause? Does it there a reason for us to go out there and whoop this guy? But after he saw that no one in Israel was going to do it, he just said, Lord, I'm not much, but you can have me. And he went out there and rebuked. He said, God will deliver you into my hand. He knew he couldn't do it. But he said, God's going to make sure that you fall by the end of the day. Not because David was the one fighting him, but he knew that if he just said, Lord, here I am, that God would do it. Why? Because God honors his word. 
So long as Israel followed after God, no one could stand against the armies of Israel. And he knew all it would take one person. Just give what he had. How many other people in the Bible didn't have much, but they gave it to God? Think of that old widow woman. Had enough to make one more meal, and her and her son were going to die. But the man of God said, suffer or permit it to be so that I get fed first. You find that in that time of famine, she never ran out of meal and she never ran out of oil. Why? Because her life was a testament of what God can do when somebody yields, just submits. We think about others. What God can do with one. What can God do with one witness? I find that Andrew, the brother of Peter, in your Gospels was the one that went and got Peter. One witness, two great, preacher, uh, great preachers came out of it. Great apostles. In fact, Peter, you find after Jesus ascends into heaven, Jesus told Peter, Peter, you love me? Three times. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. He says, feed my sheep. Till Peter went off the scene, Peter was, for lack of a better term, the head apostle for the Jews we know that the apostle Paul was sent to the Gentiles the other eleven were sent to the Jews Peter foremost among them that's why the apostle Paul said when he rebuked Peter to the face, to the face concerning the belief of uncircumcision how they had added works to salvation when he says he rebuked Peter he said when Peter said that yep I was right God convicted him of it then it was settled Everybody else accepted it because Peter had accepted it. That one man, what much? He was a doubter. He was a betrayer. Denied the Lord. You find that he was brash. You find that he was a brawler. Right? When they came to arrest Jesus, he cut off Malchus's ear with a sword. Right? You find that he was prideful. After he had denied the Lord, they were out there fishing one day, and how was he out there? Stark naked. For that time. He was wearing britches, but if you showed your thigh back in those days, you were considered naked. And he was just out there in his britches, fishing on the side of a boat, and the Lord showed up, he jumped in the water because he was ashamed. He knew he wasn't living the way they needed to live. Who was Peter? He's somebody that needed a whole lot of work. But one person said okay Lord I'll feed your sheep became a great preacher you know they didn't have him at the time the way that we refer to him now great pastor leader great witness in fact even after he's, you read the book of Acts even after God's been using him greatly God says you're going to go over there to this Gentile's house and whatever he puts on the table in front of you that's what you're going to eat Peter says not so Lord I'll defile myself then he finally got what Jesus preached about in his earthly ministry. What goes into the mouth doesn't defile the man. What's in a man's heart defiles the man. What goes in cannot defile you. It's what's on the inside that can defile the outside. So long as you give God the thanks for it, you can eat whatever you want. Hallelujah. Bacon's great. Right, but one person made a difference. Because they just said, Lord... Here's everything I've got. One witness. Philip. One witness to an Ethiopian man. Caused all the difference for that man's eternity. Then we look at the Apostle Paul. Towards the end of his ministry, what's he write? That all men had forsook him. There was just one person there left with him. Who was that? Luke the physician. But as much as Luke went, you keep in mind, Luke was the one that wrote the book of Acts. He was there documenting what God was doing in the early church. But as much as the Apostle Paul appreciated the companion, there was only one person that could bear the burden of being the Apostle to the Gentiles. That's the Apostle Paul. Everywhere he went, if somebody went with him, it wasn't too long before they weren't with him no more. Sometimes it's because God wanted them to stay behind and preach to the church or lead the church, instruct the church, deliver a letter that the Apostle Paul had written back to him. But in everything, he was alone, downcast, 
said, Never once for a second, nevertheless, the Lord stood by me. He realized that he was a murderer, that he had persecuted the very name of Christ. But he forgot those things that were behind, pressed toward the mark. What was that mark? Perfection through Christ. He said, I know I haven't gotten there yet. In fact, we find in one of his epistles, he says, I count not myself to have apprehended. In other words, I don't understand everything, but this one thing I do. You know what that one thing was? Yesterday can't be changed, but today's the day that the Lord hath made, and He can use me if I yield myself to do something for somebody else. Think about what the Lord can do with one convert. Speaking of the Apostle Paul, Philippian jailer. Just one man that got saved. But then he went back with the apostles, or with the apostle at Silas, they bound up their wounds, poured oil in them. Well, while they were there, guess what happened? His house got saved too. And then guess what happened? The church got started. You'll find that there was an epistle written to that church. It grew. And in that epistle, you'll find out that they were a great witness for a whole bunch of people. Why? Because one man understood that only God could have done what happened in the jail that night. And he forsook the way that he was raised, the way that he lived, everything that society told him was the way to live. He rejected it and just said, Lord, I believe you. One man's faith led to a whole bunch of people getting saved. You say, well, it wasn't because that guy got saved that everybody else got saved. No, but God used that one person to make an impact on other people. One convert, just like one judge, could be the difference. What about one person's faithfulness? Just one faithful person. I think of Elijah. We know that God had a bunch that God had secluded away, had kept that because they hadn't bowed their knee down, but Elijah was the one man inside of Israel at that point that hadn't bought into what the king and the wicked Jezebel had been preaching. He was the one man that just believed God enough to do whatever God said. In fact, go read over there in 1 Kings when fire came down from heaven. Well, I didn't pray it down. You fine. Go read the prayer that he prayed. It's not that long. You know what he prayed? Lord, I've done everything that you told me to do. Not because what I did is going to make a difference, but Lord, I've followed your instructions. I pray that you show up and do whatever you got planned. And he didn't pray so that they knew that he was the man of God. King already knew who Elijah was. He sent some soldiers out one time and said, Hey, there's this crazy guy down there that said he wasn't going to do what we told him to do. And he said, Describe him. He said, That's Elijah. Elijah the Tishbite. That crazy old guy. Why'd the king know about him? Because Elijah just believed God enough to go tell even the king to his face that the way that he was living was wicked. What did God do with one man? Well, he turned Israel upside down. Elijah, just human like us. He had moments of doubt, moments of weakness. But you find that he just believed God more than he believed in his own weakness. He said, I know I'm not enough, but I believe God is. Along that same vein, you've got Daniel, all the years of his life, all that he went through, it was just one man that stayed faithful to God. What did God do with him? God did a whole lot. The book of Daniel's real short. There's a whole lot in between them lines, Daniel being the second most powerful person in the entire kingdom. In a foreign land with foreign kings and foreign princes that plotted against him, but yet there was one person that stood right next to the king whose life showed that God's stronger than any king, any army, stronger than any shackles of he was a slave. He said, God's bigger than all that. And his life proved it. Think about just one person being faithful. What did Elijah's life do? It inspired Elisha. Just one person and their lifetime commitment. It wasn't just one person standing up on one day that said, you know what, today I'm going to believe God more than I ever have before. No, it was a life, a pattern of works. 
a testimony that proved that they believed what they said. Because their whole life backed it up. Those that are faithful change the fates of nations. Go back and study on that map back there. Didn't always used to look like that. In fact, depending on how old that map is, there's probably countries now that aren't on that map over there. It's always shifting. Yeah, go read that book, The Trail of the Blood, or Fox's Books of Martyr, or Book of Martyrs. You'll find that God doesn't use the majority to get things done. He uses the minority. And in many instances, it's just a handful. And how's a handful usually start? One. But it was one person standing up and saying, no, we're going to stick to the old path. Regardless of what was threatened against them, regardless of what was promised would happen to them and their families if they didn't denounce the name of Christ, one person would stand up and say, no, I just believe him more than I believe you. And then you study out how our country was founded. It's just a small group said we believe the way that this country should be is the way that God intended it to be. What's the thing that they hate most nowadays about our country? Well, it's the Constitution. They want to change it, want to pervert it. Why? Because you read it. You can't get too far into it before you hear about the Creator. How He made all men equal. The way that God made us in His own image. He gave us free will. Why? So that we would choose to use it for Him. But you find God can use one to make a whole big difference. You know why our country was founded the way that it was? Because one person just stood up one day and said, I believe that this is the way it should be. And there was a townhouse in Pennsylvania over there in Philadelphia where they argued it and they realized that one guy was right. Because one stood up, said this is the way God intended it to be. Others realized that that is the way that it should be. And it didn't happen quickly. If you're a student of American history, they boarded themselves up in there and they argued for a while, trying to hash things out. In fact, part of that story is down that wall over there with them portraits that our pastor hung up. Where one man endorsed Madison who ended up, I believe, becoming our fourth president of the United States, endorsed him to be the representative for their state to the Constitutional Convention. You know why he embraced or supported Madison? Because Madison promised that the first thing after the Constitution would be a Bill of Rights, and in the very first one, freedom of religion. That men can worship God as they see fit. And say, how'd that all start? One person standing up. Every great event throughout history that God started began with one person just saying, I believe God's enough, even if I'm not. Great faith. In fact, Jesus said it didn't take much faith for us to be able to say to a mountain, be removed, cast it into the sea. Faith isn't one thing. There's a whole lot of little faith. Very few that have. Just faith the size of a grain of mustard seed. Something minute. But yet, even in the example, Jesus said that one seed goes into the ground and a great big tree comes out. If we just exercise it a little bit, what can happen? I don't know. Whatever God wants to happen. And that's above what I can dream up. Because he said that if his people, which were called by his name, would follow after that God would show them great and mighty things which they know is not. I know quite a bit, but I don't know everything. And I promise you, I don't know what he's got in store. Why? Because his ways are above our ways. But you say, I never could. Well, you can't, but he can. And if he wills, he can use you. And as I was thinking about these things, do we not have a camp meeting coming up? In every service, we've heard our pastor say, one person has the key 
for God showing up and doing what God wants to do. Then extrapolate that. Every day, somebody's got the key for God doing something great in the midst of His people. Every year, there's something that God wants to do that's great and mighty. But see, go back to our verses. God always wanted God's people to be in His will, following after His direction. He always wanted to give handfuls on purpose to them. He always wanted to give to them, pressed down, shaking and bubbling over. Why couldn't God do that? Because of people. Then the same is true for the opposite effect. You know why God's people would forsake the things of God? Because one person one day started talking about how they didn't believe God. Because faith is contagious, but likewise, unbelief is contagious. Doubt is contagious. Misery is contagious. One's a lonely number, but if you're willing to stand there, people will start joining you. Why did Israel end up the way that they did every second generation after a judge would go off the scene? Because one person stood up and said, I don't think we should follow after God. And why did they return to the things of God? Because God raised up one person to stand up and say, this is the way that God intended it, and this is the way we're going to do it. Then you study the life of those that made a stand for Christ. They gave everything that they had. They just proclaimed what God put in their heart. That they just went and told others what God did for them because they believed that God would do it for them too. Those groups of one, they didn't always have an easy life. Didn't always have a life that others would aspire to have but they had a life with God's hand on it. The reason there aren't more people that just stand up and say, if I'm the only one, this is how I'm going to live, is because they fear losing what God's already given them. And then on top of that, they fear that they're not enough, that they can't do it. And they're right. The arm of flesh will fail you. Lean not on your own understanding. Can't even trust your own heart. It's deceitfully wicked. No man can know it. The Bible says that our tongues are set on fire of hell. That even on our best day, it can whip us real quick. But he also promised, not that, you know, we live in the dispensation of grace. We don't need to wait on one judge to come along and present the plan for us to live according to how God would have us to live oh no he said now that you're saved you don't have to lean on another person he said I will indwell you truly one person that stands up they're never alone because God's with them didn't we read in verse number 18 that the Lord was with the judge every believer God's there with you just waiting for you to be the one one service one person may be the difference between God showing up and having a service like we've never had before or going out scratching our heads saying man it felt like something was going to happen but then it just died off why did that happen because one person quenched the Holy Ghost God is a God of details he cares about the one person that stands up for him. he also cares about the one person that doesn't do what God would have us to do imagine if instead of one person there was one church that stood up and said the reason we're in this shape is because America doesn't fear God anymore and instead of just doing a campaign for a while instead of just having a camp meeting come together and say we just believe God can do something that nobody else can do what if instead of a time of that it was a lifetime of that we're real good with fads. We're real good with trends. Some of us still trying to hang on to the past, hoping that them clothes that we have in the closet will come back into fashion again. But there aren't enough that are just sold out to say, no matter what happens around, we're sticking to this. You want proof that God wants to do something? There's a plane out there on the wall that God's not done. We need more room. 
But why do we need more room? Because God wants to send more people. But see, our vision being ours, we want to see a plan. We want to see a road map to success. Right? Why do you think that that book that was completely unbiblical, 40 Days of Purpose, why did that sell? Because people want 40 days in order to change their life around. They can understand that. It was a plan. It was a program. There was a routine. Nothing is routine with God. Every day, something different that makes us uncomfortable so that He gets the glory from it. These people that stood up and just said, Lord, I'm all yours, they never backed out of the commitment. They never said, well, Lord, that's too far. Or, Lord, this is too much. You'll find that they had those thoughts, but then they also realized that it's too much for them, but not too much for God. That because it was too much for them, when God stepped in and did it, no man could take the credit for it. God was glorified for it. Not enough people stand up because they don't want to get out in them uncharted waters where the water's over their head. We like saying, well, Lord, I'll go out neck deep. Why? Because our feet are still on the ground. We still think that we have some control. If it ever dawned in on us that the platform I'm standing on couldn't hold me if God didn't want it to. Us being able to touch the ground doesn't make any difference. It's just God winking at our ignorance that He doesn't just let the ground open up and swallow us up like it did the walls of Jericho. But there are all these things that we think, well, if I can just... If I can handle this, then God can do something great. God can do something great whether you can handle it or not. God can change the course of a nation whether you think He can or not. In fact, God usually does things, study your Bible, the way that people never expect it. He uses base things to confound the wise. And the world can learn a whole lot, but the, what do they lack? They never come to the knowledge of truth. And what's that truth? He's enough. Because some people believed enough to actually stand up, to actually give themselves, to actually go out and tell somebody else. God used them to make a great difference. And all that is recorded about all that God has done and plans to do, it always started with one. Did God make all mankind at once? No, He made one. His name is Adam. God intended it just to be Him and Adam, but then God saw that Adam needed to help me, and then He gave him Eve. You know why Eve was as faithful as she was for as long as she was? Because one told her about the one that made him. You know why Abel followed after? Because one stood and told him about what God intended and how God expected them to live, and Abel just believed it. From the beginning, God always dealt with one. Just imagine what he could do if we decided to be the one. Because see, God can do a whole lot with one. He can do a whole lot more with more. The more people that stand up, the greater an impact that it'll have. You don't believe me? Go read the book of Acts. God turned the world upside down with 12 disciples and one of them was of the devil then you look at the church of Jerusalem when God sent persecution to scatter them because they weren't out and fulfilling the great commission a whole church that was scattered they turned not just Jerusalem not just Israel they literally turned the whole world as they knew it at that point upside down why because they just believed that God could if we could get us out of the way and realize, I don't care how he does it, don't care what happens to me while he does it, I just want him to do it. If we sold out that way, imagine what God could do with one. Yeah, we're, our country's in bad shape, whole world's in bad shape. None of it caught God by surprise. He's just waiting for one to stand up and say, Lord, whatever it takes, I want you to do something. And I'll do whatever it takes, I'll say whatever it takes, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Because I do find that little is much when God is in it. I do find that His grace is sufficient. And I do find that He promised never to leave us nor forsake us. 
What's that mean? He's already taken care of all the reasons that it can't happen. All we have to do is allow it to happen. And you know where that battle takes place? Right here. The difference between one and none happens here. Either we're all in or we're all out. And too often we use little excuses to make the biggest impacts on whether or not we're going to follow after God. So with the camp meeting coming up, there's no telling what God can do. I don't, I remember what he did around here last summer. Can't say that I remember all of them, but I remember all the meetings that we had in the old building and in this building. Just took one meeting to fan the flame a little bit. Just took one message and people latching on to it to make all the difference in their life. Just one. Not everything. Not everybody all at once. Just one at a time. I mean, he saved us one at a time. So if we individually make the decision that we're going to follow after him, it doesn't matter what those around us do. All that matters is that God can do. So imagine if one, one meeting, just over a few days, one person or many people just stood up individually, not basing it off of who was going to support them and what they were doing, just saying, I decide I'm going to follow and do whatever he wants me to do. Imagine what he could do in one weekend and then the weeks after that. I've seen what he could do in a day. Imagine if we just stayed committed. What he could do in a month or in a year. Or if the Lord doesn't come back, what he could do in 10 years. I don't know what he can do, but I do know that it starts with one. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.